Welcome to the third season of Murder in 20 Podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. April Millsap grew up a happy child, someone who liked to read and write, especially poetry. She told jokes and expressed her creativity with brightly painted fingernails. When she was six, her mom married her stepdad, David Lichtenfeld. Living in the village of Armada in Michigan, a small town of less than 2,000 people, it was a place where everyone knew each other. In grade six, April met Madison Adams, and they became best friends. In middle school, April, like most teenagers, lived on her cell phone, easily identified by its teddy bear case. April had a few boyfriends. Then in grade seven, she met Austin Albertson. There was something special about him. The couple dated all through grade eight. On July 24, 2014, it was the middle of summer break. Lifetime TV's Text Me When You Get Home reported that April got up around noon and stayed in her room on her computer and cell phone making plans with her friends. At 5 p.m., she had a salad for dinner. 45 minutes later, April decided to take the family dog Penny for a walk. April's mother, Jennifer, knew that her daughter sometimes used Penny as an excuse to go out and meet Austin or her friends, but she didn't let on that she knew. Penny was a loyal collie, and if she was with April, her mother didn't worry. April grabbed her cell phone and put snacks in a water bowl for Penny in her backpack. Wearing a white tank top and blue jean shorts, she headed out the door. At 6 p.m., April arrived at the Macomb Orchard Trail, surrounded by bush and trees. At 8 feet wide, it accommodates walkers, hikers, and cyclists. April began her walk with Penny by her side. Meanwhile, James Van Callis lived 20 miles away in Wales Township as reported by USA Today. Arrested many times for petty crimes, the 32-year-old had a rap sheet going back 10 years. He and his girlfriend, Crystal, were on and off again together for nine years, and a few weeks ago had just gotten back together. But James had a thing for young girls, a fetish he hid from everyone. On his computer, he searched for ways to get teenage girls to talk to him. And he went so far as to take videos of young girls in public without their knowledge. On July 24th, Crystal was home when James left the house around 4.30 p.m. heading to his brother's. Wearing camel pants, a hoodie, and his favorite Air Jordan sneakers, James hopped on his white motorcycle and roared off. Near the end of his 20-minute drive, James spotted a beautiful young girl with long brown hair walking her dog. It happened so fast, he just reacted. He stopped his motorcycle and began walking it on the trail and caught up to April. He tried to strike up a conversation with her but she wasn't interested and brushed him off. Perhaps it was because of what he said, or maybe it was because he didn't take off his black motorcycle helmet. Either way, this guy had April's instincts 
on high alert. Court records reported that at 6.25 p.m., Derek Rushke was walking with his daughters and briefly noticed April and James. Eric recognized April from church, and being an avid dirt biker, he also noticed the white motorcycle and the modifications that had been done to it. Moments later, Amy and Gail Spinella saw April and James, who was on his motorcycle. When they came back through the area a few minutes later, April was gone. Her dog Penny was whimpering, and standing nearby, they saw a man with piercing eyes. Mary Stein also saw April and James and found it strange that there was a motorcycle on the trail and that a young girl was with a much older man. Then she noticed he had an angry look on his face. James took off and April was relieved. She and Penny continued on their walk. At 6.28 p.m., April texted Austin to tell him, I think I almost got kidnapped. OMFG. But Austin didn't see his girlfriend's text. He was in a neighboring town with a friend, grabbing a bite to eat, and was out of cell range. But James did not leave. He put the kickstand down on his bike and crept up on April. He surprised her. Using his muscle and six-foot frame, he grabbed her and dragged her off the trail and down a steep ditch, then up the other side and into the thick bush and trees. April wasn't giving up easy. She managed to release his grip and ran through the woods, zigzagging, trying to get away. But he caught up to her. She broke free again and ran for her life. He sprinted after her. After ten minutes, James managed to pin April on the ground and used his helmet to hit her numerous times in the face and head trying to get her to stop fighting. But she never gave up. She squirmed and fought with everything she had, her fingers grabbing at leaves and dirt. He pulled her top and bra down to her waist and pushed her shorts down to her ankles. Her shoes had been kicked off in the fight. She still wouldn't stop fighting. James continued to hit her with his helmet. Then he stood up and stomped on her head and neck. He used his Air Jordans to stomp on her beautiful young face before standing on her neck with such force that she stopped breathing. April died at 14. At 6.44 p.m., James heard someone coming. He grabbed April's cell phone and backpack and fled. At 6.55 p.m., Eric and his daughters passed by the spot they'd seen April and James. Both were gone, as was a motorcycle. At 7 p.m., James arrived at his brother's house. Jennifer realized her daughter wasn't home yet, but she wasn't too concerned as April enjoyed spending time outdoors. Then a few minutes later, she wondered if April had gotten sidetracked. So she texted her, Bring the dog home. No answer. So she texted, Where are you? No answer. Then texted, Call me. No answer. Now she was getting anxious and texted, Come home. Again, no answer. 
She texted, let me know where you are. Jennifer was getting scared. At 7.45 p.m., Jennifer called April's cell phone. It went straight to voicemail. So she called Austin, but he hadn't heard from her. Then Austin arrived back in town and was within cell range when April's text from earlier came through. At first, he thought it was just April playing a joke. But what if she wasn't? He and his friend Alex drove over to April's house to show her mother the text. Jennifer asked Austin and Alex to go with her to the Macomb Orchard Trail to look for April. The trail splits off into three directions, and each took a different path. Meanwhile, Matthew Zadig and his wife had entered the park to go jogging when they spotted a dog running out of the woods and wondered where the owner was. They followed the dog back into the woods and deep into the abyss and spotted a body. They returned to the trail and called 911. The Armada Police Department is very small. They responded to the scene and immediately realized it was a homicide and called in the Michigan State Police. Jennifer, Austin, and Alex soon noticed the police presence on the trail and told police they were looking for her daughter. Police asked them to meet them at the station. Jennifer and David drove to the station, but David was told there wasn't room inside and was asked to wait outside. As he spoke with Jennifer and the boys, he sat in the car and waited. David turned on the radio and soon heard about a body being found on the Macomb Orchard Trail and knew they'd found his daughter. Meanwhile, James had returned home. His girlfriend, Crystal, woke in the middle of the night to see him using a sock and hand sanitizer to clean his running shoes. She thought that was odd and asked him about it. He responded that he was cleaning off some oil and told her that he'd messed up and needed her to stand by his side. Police must first rule out those closest to the victim and started with April's parents. They were quickly ruled out. They moved on to her boyfriend, Austin. Police found it odd that he didn't respond to April's text about kidnapping, and it made them suspicious. But he provided an alibi. The news burned through the small town at lightning speed. April's friend, Serena, texted all her friends with the news. And they all answered, all except April. The next day, numerous agencies were brought in to track down April's killer. Court records stated those included the Macomb County Sheriff's Office, the Violent Crimes Task Force, the Homicide Task Force, the Southeastern Michigan Crimes Against Children Group, and the FBI. Over 60 officers participated in the investigation. Officers knocked on doors, set up checkpoints for vehicles, and dredged a nearby lake. Investigators knew finding April's phone was imperative. It could contain her last words in a text or a post on social media. Evidence that might help them solve her murder. And they had to find it fast before the battery died. An agent from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms was brought in. Matthew Sent specialized in cell phone technology. He contacted April's cell phone provider to find out which cell phone tower her phone had last pinged off of. Then he identified a narrow strip about the size of one square mile. 
Using technology that mimics a cell phone tower, he drove to the area. It wasn't long before the technology made contact with April's phone. He stopped the car in an area surrounded by rural farmland and trees and called authorities. An officer and a service dog took off into the trees and within 15 minutes recovered April's phone still in his teddy bear case. The medical examiner ruled April's official cause of death was blunt head trauma and asphyxia due to neck compression. Investigators found no evidence at the scene. However, on April's body, a very clear shoe print was visible, one with a distinctive herringbone pattern, along with some type of logo. Over 8,000 tips poured in, as reported by CBC News. One of those included a white painter's fan. A young girl reported that as it drove slowly by her, someone in the van pointed at her. That prompted hundreds of tips. Then the owner of the van came forward to say he was a contractor and was pointing out houses that he'd worked on to a co-worker. Investigators were back at square one. Then Eric, Mary, Amy, and Gail all contacted police to tell them what they saw that day. Another witness, William Buchanan, also came forward. He hadn't seen April, but he had seen James on his motorcycle and positively identified him. A police sketch of James was drawn, and police were now looking for him and his distinctive motorcycle. Three days after her brutal murder, a police officer canvassing the neighborhood spotted a motorcycle that fit the description. He pulled over and photographed it. Police discovered it belonged to James Van Callis. At 10 p.m., they knocked on James's door. He was cooperative and showed officers his helmet and running shoes, but not the shoes he had worn that night. Police asked about his alibi, and he provided his brother, who later confirmed it. But police believed his brother was lying. They asked for his phone and discovered his GPS placed him in Armada that night. Police then executed a search warrant. No evidence was found at James's home linking him to April. Forensics came back with the analysis on James' running shoes, and they were not a match. Investigators spoke with Crystal numerous times. At first, she backed her boyfriend's story, but eventually she crumbled and told the truth. That she saw James cleaning his Air Jordans, but then after that, they disappeared. Investigators scanned James' Facebook account and spotted him wearing Air Jordans and asked Crystal if they were the same ones from that night. She confirmed they were. Investigators ordered the identical shoes and sent them to the forensic lab, where it was determined the distinctive shoe print and logo stomped onto April's face was an exact match. The forensic team analyzed April's phone and discovered she had been using a fitness app that used GPS to track her steps. The app recorded her walking speed that night to be 2.2 miles per hour. Then her speed doubled to 4.4. For 10 minutes, the app showed her zigzagging back and forth. Then all of a sudden, her phone took off in a straight line at 22 miles per hour. 
Investigators retraced the path April's phone had taken through the town's streets and noticed a security camera on a home's front porch. They retrieved the video and it showed a white motorcycle driving by. On October 8th, James was charged with April's murder. He pled not guilty. A year and a half later, in January 2016, James went on trial. On the fifth day, the judge, who happened to be a woman, ordered him to put on his motorcycle helmet. James did as he was instructed, but not before, becoming explosive and yelling at the judge. In that split second, he illustrated just how fast his rage could come out. It's likely the jury took note. James was found guilty of felony murder, kidnapping, and attempted sexual assault, and sentenced to life in prison without parole. James filed an appeal but it was denied. April was an aspiring poet, and we can remember her with the words she wrote in her poem titled, The Stars. Look at the stars. Tell me what you see. Is there a picture of me? Look at their shine. Look how they glisten. If you be careful and listen, they weep your name ever so softly. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Daryl Richard Ennis. He was only 12 when he shot his parents dead in cold blood. Rick was released back into society by his 21st birthday. Five years later, pretty Lori Slisinski knew nothing about his past when she spurned his romantic advances. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Fasting Studios, and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who were listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, Past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. And feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them, or not shy. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers. <laughs>